Um, okay, well, it's such a joy, guys, to be able to continue to look at a really important subject, in my opinion. And if you have a Bible, could you turn to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 25? Matthew chapter 25. Um, last week, we looked at um, the third principle um, from the book, The Emotionally Healthy Church, that we're just using much of the material to think about uh, integrating emotional health with our spiritual and physical lives. And we looked at uh, what I think personally, when you think of the seven principles in total, I think if you think of the third one last week's, which was living in brokenness and vulnerability, or as Jesus put it, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you see that one as almost like the center of all the seven, I think it's really helpful. It's almost like the goal is that we live in that beautiful place where we are aware of our fragility and our weakness. And we're not living in that pride and that defensiveness that we spoke about. Uh, and a whole, a whole group of people who are like that, genuinely humble, broken and vulnerable, man, that's, that's massive. That's huge. To be a people who are broken and vulnerable is what the world desperately i think needs to see um i really don't think we often need strategies as much as we think or flashy this or flashy that just being poor in spirit like jesus was knowing our need for god man that's so rare and so powerful it leads to joy it leads to god getting more glory it leads to uh, people feeling safe around us it leads to us having an internal authority because we're not scared of saying things that our old glittering proud self would have tried to not say so we didn't lose that. It leads to so much good. So the next final four principles after that third one, I think the best way of seeing it is they are like the implications of the consequences of that third one. They're the implications of that third one. What does it therefore mean to actually live? in brokenness and vulnerability and the first one of of the implications which is principle four is that we need to realize we have limits the title of the chapter is actually uh it's quite um fascinating it's receiving the gift of limits not just admitting that we have limits but seeing the limits around us as a strange and wonderful kind of gift i.e if you think about the logic if we are aware that we are, we are limited, we are um, broken and vulnerable, we're not uh, supermen and superwomen, the obvious next consequence is that we are limited physically, emotionally, socially, intellectually, spiritually. We, we have limits. And I know that probably we go, you hear that and you think, yeah, that's obvious, Tom. But actually, the world in which we live, I think it promotes... Uh, often unconsciously, the opposite of that. I went to a school which was very academically rigorous. And the kind of the message of the school was this, is that if you work hard enough, you will have no limits as to what you can do. In fact, most of the quotes, if you Google in like quotations on limits, they're all like seeing limits as this bad thing that, you know, there's no, the only limits that you have are the ones you put on yourself. And, and honestly, the air we breathe in, in America is very much that that if you try hard, there are no limits as to what you can do, which obviously sounds wonderful and sort of at one level fills us with this sort of air of expectancy and hope and enthusiasm. And it's not all bad. I just don't think it's biblical. <laughs> I don't think having an expectation that you can have no limits, that your life is limitless, is actually true. I, I think, honestly, I, I don't think it's true. And I, I think it actually leads to a kind of unhealth. I don't think it leads to the things that we think we want it to. I think it often leads to a whole host, in fact, of emotional lack of health. Living subconsciously with a sense of, I, have, I should have no limits. Um, if I just try hard, if I work hard, which we pick up from the world or from school or combination of many other things, it leads to an exhausting way of living. And I want to boldly say today that I do agree with Pete Scazzaro and I agree with the Bible 
that actually limits can be a kind of gift. And I would even say this, I think two of the um, emotional traits that we most crave as humans, which is contentment and peace, which are similar but different, can only come through an ever-increasing realization of God-ordained limits in our life. And I know that's hard. I, I, and we feel this weird tension where mentally we know that we have limits. But if you're anything like me, I, at one level, hate those limits. I hate the 101 limits around me. I rail against them uh, by nature. But my, my, bold, um, my bold appeal for us today is that I think the Bible actually leads us to see limits as a friend from God. Limits are there to actually give us the emotional health that we often crave and we don't connect with the idea of limits. It seems like a negative, but I believe it is actually a positive. I think it's a kind gift of God to often protect us from ourselves. Jesus says here in Matthew 25, it's a famous passage. We could have gone to loads of different places to illustrate the biblical warrant for limits. I've just chosen Matthew 25. Jesus tells his parable. Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and he entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money to another two talents and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Now, the, the famous story goes on, and the, the main point of this parable is that with whatever talents God has given us, we shouldn't just bury them. We need to use them and invest them. That's the main point. But the prelude to the main point is obviously, as we've just read in the opening two verses, that Jesus, God, gives each of us different amounts of talents, different energy levels, different intellectual levels, different social capacities, different spiritual capacities. We're all different. And we are all given certain specific things which, which have limits to them. And understanding that is the first inevitable consequence and implication if we try and actually work out what does it mean to live in brokenness and vulnerability. And there are two things that I think the Bible tells us about limits that I think are crucial if embracing get limits is ever going to approach something in your mind as a gift. There are two things that we need to just see in scripture that Jesus is uh, helping us to see from this parable. First of all is that limits bring life. Limits should bring a kind of life. And number two Limits, though, do need to be learned. It's not an instinctive thing for us, and I'll explain why. So first of all, then, limits, I want to argue limits should actually bring life. Now, I hear you say, Tom, I, I'm, not, I'm not tracking with you at all. I hate my limits. Um, you know, we're in lockdown right now, and you're talking about limits. This is insensitive, Tom. I want to burst open my doors, run onto the streets of, of wherever I live, and be free again. I, I totally get that we are globally in something of a jonah belly of the whale time okay we we just are and either we say that equals bad and freedom and lack of limits is what equals good and of course to a degree there's truth in that but there's a nuance that i'm appealing to that i want us to understand because i would put it this way i think when we don't embrace the limits that god has for us um, we tend to believe one or of two or sometimes both lies that ultimately are incredibly destructive. If we don't believe that we have limits, number one, you might want to write this down. We tend to believe that there is no limit to what we can attain. That's the first like if we if we don't if you don't agree with me and you basically think, no, there are no limits. The first kind of opposite truth to not living with limits is therefore we believe we have no limits specifically in the realm of how much we can attain how much we can get but of course this actually leads not to a sense of um the joy and the uh, the hope that we that we think if you're living with that lie which is i am unlimited in how much i can attain in life as long as i work hard and i study hard and i have a good discipline what that actually leads to 
rather than contentment, which is one of the great things we desire, it actually leads to comparison. It leads to an endless internal sense that I have not quite got enough. If I can just work harder, I can attain a better job, a better body, a better group of friends, a bigger house, etc. So the opposite of believing you have limits with regards how much you can attain is believing that if you just ultimately try hard, there is no limits to what you can attain. And I want to argue that leads actually to a comparison, to a kind of restlessness, to an exhaustion, rather than a contentment, which I believe limits can bring. Is that you? First quick question. Does that resonate with you? Are you someone who tends to unconsciously feel confused when more things don't open up to you, when that job promotion doesn't come, or that, that next thing in your mind that somehow you feel entitled to attain doesn't actually come? What that can be telling us is that there's a lie in us that there should be no limits to what we can attain. The second um, reason why I think limits should bring life is not just because they free us from this comparison and lead us more and more into contentment, but also, which is a, um, a similar but related and different thing, is that if we don't believe we have limits, we ultimately believe, well, there's no limits, therefore, to how much I can sustain. So we either believe there's no limits to what we can attain, get, or we tend to fall into the camp of, have, of believing the lie, there's no limits to what I can sustain. And this will appeal to different groups here. Maybe you're the sort of person who, who loves to feel helpful. You love to feel like you can sort of save everyone. And maybe for you, the kind of uh, a common emotion you will feel is not so much like that kind of restlessness that I described in scenario one. It's more like a guilt. You're often feeling like you're failing other people. And that comes from the lie that you have no limits as to how much you can sustain. So does this describe you? Pete Scazzaro, page 150. He says this, these are some of the signs he knows he's either living beyond his limits. He's believing the lie that there are no limits to what he can attain or sustain this is what he looks like i am anxious i am rushing or hurrying my body is in a knot i am doing too many things my mind cannot stop racing i am driving too fast i am not able to be fully present with people I'm irritable about the simple tasks of life, like having to wait in line at the supermarket. I am skimming over time with God. I think he's right. I think that when we are unconsciously living with this lie, that there is no limit to how much I can attain if I work hard, or there's no limit to how much I can sustain if I work hard. That is how we end up living. Anyone here identify with those kind of traits in your soul? You say, yeah, that, that this kind of describes me, Tom, actually. Isn't it interesting, though, how then you see, when you suddenly go back to Scripture, you suddenly realize why so many of the men and women of the Bible that actually demonstrate godliness, a hugely common thread with all of them is that they understood their limits. King David before he fought Goliath, he was happily in obscurity, being a shepherd. He wasn't fighting the limits. He wasn't thinking, I should be off fighting Goliath with my brothers. He seems content playing guitar in the fields. He's not pushing for more. He's not trying to attain more. He's content with his limits. You see, with Paul in the New Testament, Paul is the Jew of Jews. And God says, guess what? You're going to go to the Gentiles. It's like, what? Yeah, I'm going to put a limit on you. I want you to go out to the overtly Gentile pagan world. There's a limit that God puts on Paul. You're not going there. I want you to spend your life doing that. And yet Paul doesn't push against that. He submits to God's limits on him. 
You see it with Jesus in his humanity, first 30 years of his life. There's no apparent miracles or Jesus doing anything obviously miraculous. Even though there's ill people everywhere, it's not the timing. He, he's happy for his limits. I'm, I'm waiting for the Father. In fact, the temptations th that he has with Satan are all Satan trying to tempt him to break his limits. And in fact, it's a fair understanding of what happened in the Garden of Eden, Eden to understand it as a breaking of limits, isn't it? That's a good definition of what sin was. God said, Adam and Eve, you've got the whole garden, rock and roll. Oh, there's one, there's one tree. Don't eat from that. What happens? They have to break through that one limit God gave them. So you see, whilst I am not against aspiration, and I want my kids to, to reach their, their potential and to go for it, there is a subtle difference between that and where it strays into this place of willfulness. And it's almost like a, a delusion of grandeur a delusion of grandeur that we can, if we can just try hard, we should be able to attain whatever we ask for and work hard for. Or we, we should be able to sustain every single person who looks to me in some way to help and save them. And some of you are so exhausted because you're in that second category and you feel this continual guilt. I mean, I woke up with it this morning, like I'd failed someone, I had to join, I, it's just the first thing in my mind, this thought came into my head, about a perception of someone and I thought oh, I better failed them and I, and then I was like that's I don't think that's even true I don't think they're thinking about that about me but I this is and it, there's this lie that I can slip into of feeling like um you know I can sustain everyone's happiness <laughs> if I try hard I mean it's crazy where does that come from? Oh, yeah, it comes from actually thinking I'm God. Because it is a delusion of grandeur. It looks all terribly humble. Tom, you know, he cares for people. And there's a good love of people. But for me, it's often actually about me wanting them to kind of be happy again so that they then praise me for, for supporting them. So both those two, those two traps, i.e. trying to attain too much or trying to sustain too much, actually both come from the same heart, which is pride. It's like a, a delusion of grandeur. And, uh, and God wants to give us instead a deep sense of contentment rather than comparison and a deep sense of peace rather than pressure. Hallelujah. This is actually real. I can testify that I genuinely believe this is one of the major agendas of God is to free us from the lie that we have no limits, not out of cruelty, but out of kindness, out of fatherly love, so that we become ever more content and ever more at peace. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I was, um, I was just reading, my big brother, he's written loads of books, and I, I actually started to read one of them properly a few weeks ago, and I read this thing. And as I read it, I was like, oh my word, this is amazing. There, and I had this revelation of like, no matter how much I try, I could never write. I could just never write as well as that. He's got a God-given gift. And it was this strange moment because I knew him. I was like, that's my big brother. And I just knew, because uh, I'm proud, I always want to be the best at everything. I want to attain as much as I can. God was, I just felt this little, like, little reminder of like, the content's brilliant. And isn't it interesting, Tom, you, you couldn't, you know deep down, you couldn't write that. And I didn't feel condemned. I actually felt released. I was like, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not an author. I've written one book with the help of Liz Jennings and it's pretty good, but I could never do that. And it was so good for my soul, embracing that limit that, um, do you know, everything, everything is a gift. Everything's a gift. I was sitting in my lounge two days ago and I looked at this bit of paper and on this plain bit of paper, Poppy had drawn this map. Um, Poppy's my eight year old and she'd drawn a map of our house in Madison Street. And then there was this, then the Blue Water Tower near us. And then there was the Walker's house, which is near us. And then there was a little picture of the school, and a picture of the dollar store, and a picture of the field near our house she plays in. And as I sat there, I just started to just to weep. Because I felt the father just saying, look, Tom, a year into San Francisco, 
as a gift, I have given Poppy the beginnings of a sense of being home. She was like mapping, you know, those are the things that make home home, aren't they? Those kind of collection of all those things. And I felt God say, I have given that to you as a gift. And I sat there just crying like with this bit of paper going, Jesus, I could, I could always, there's part of me that always wants more. And I just saw this bit of paper and it was like this, this thing that had just been on the floor. I hadn't even noticed it. I felt God saying, I have given you a gift, which is your youngest daughter starting to feel at home in this city. And then I looked up and I saw a pair of van trainers that my dear wife had bought for me as a gift. And she got them on Poshmark. They weren't brand new. And part, you know, there's always part of you that can be like, oh, I wonder if that got the right color or whatever. And I just felt God saying, that's another gift. You haven't attained that. It's just a gift. My kind gift through your wife to you. And then I looked up and I saw my coffee bean grinder. And I remembered that a year ago it had broken when my brother-in-law and my, my sister-in-law were with us from England and they'd just gone off and bought it. They'd gone and bought a new one for us. And I just looked up and I saw it and I felt God say, you didn't attain that either. I gave that to you, do you remember? And then I looked up and I saw our TV, which isn't new, it's probably 10 years old, but it's enormous. And it was a gift from the Walkers. Um, they were given it and they said, it's just too big, you can have it. And I remember thinking, I've wanted a bigger telly for so long. And Jesus is just, and I just was sitting there in my room, looking around the lounge, just thinking, everything's a gift. I haven't attained any of this. And I just felt this joy and this sense of contentment that, that God, God is a kind God. And, and, and it's a work of the spirit, this kind of thing, right? You can't make this happen. But God's agenda is that you would shift from shifting from all the things that you haven't yet got that you could attain if you just worked out a bit harder to sitting in that place of being able to just taste and see the hundreds of good gifts around us that he's given. We haven't attained anything. That's why John the Baptist said, you know, I must decrease, he must increase. Only a man can have what he's received from heaven. But not just contentment comes rather than comparison when we embrace limits and that God has given us everything, it's, you know, we haven't attained it. He's given it to us. There's also a peace that comes from feeling like you need to sustain everyone. You know, that is such a killer lie. I don't know where it comes from, but I don't know if you're like me and you can so often mark guilt in your, in your average day, you feel like you're not doing enough to kind of sustain other people around you. When you start to realize, you know what? Of course, I'm called to do good, but I actually have real limits as to what I can do. Um, it's amazing how that starts to lead to an incredible sense of peace. I, um, I remember meeting with a buddy of mine after he'd been through a terribly tough couple of years. And um, we met in the pub and um, I remember just, he, he, I know he wanted to challenge me because I think he felt really let down by me. And we're a good friend, but I remember I just, he was like, how are you doing? And I was just pretty honest. I was just like, honestly, it's been a, really, it's been a really hard couple of years. And I was just being honest. And I remember um, he then heard, listened, and then shared his sense of, you know, sadness about that, but also his sense of me letting him down in a very gentle way. But I remember feeling like, honestly, with good conscience, I was at my limits. I could not have done. I wanted to be Superman for him. I really did. I knew he was going through even more sort of dramatic bad stuff than me. But I knew in my heart, really, I couldn't have done anything. And ultimately, it was like a growth moment for me. I remember sitting there thinking, man, I so feel that. And I, I'm not going to defend myself. I, I know if I was you, I would have wanted me to be like you're describing. But brother, I just, I'm sorry for your pain. But I, I you know, I just, I'm, I, I know that there's a limit to what I can sustain. There's a limit to what I can sustain. And even doing this church plant, I, I have to fight off guilt all the time. You know, I remember trying to, um, trying to, do this like support there's this network that helps church plants support but you have to do loads of extra stuff and i remember it just felt like Saul's armor but i didn't i just thought i i felt guilty not doing it i thought i want to give this church plant the best it can but it was killing me 
It was absolutely killing me. Oh my gosh. I mean, it was just taking me beyond my limits. You know, when there's that point, you're like, no, this isn't like, this isn't like a good stretching thing. I am violating my soul doing this. And no one else can make that decision for you. And in the end, I just, I knew I would let this group down because they'd invested me. I thought I'd be letting the leaders at Sanctuary and you guys down. But in the end, I just said, I'm so sorry. I've just got to, I've just got to kind of step away from this. And the moment I did it, the sense of peace and guilt just melted away. So friends, first of all, then my, my first point is that limits should bring life. And let me just ask you this question. It's a quick limits assessment question. How easily can you say that it, you can even try this now? Just think about it. There is a limit to how much I can attain. It's almost like a wine. Try drinking that even now. Just think of how does that feel? Does that make you feel like, no, Tom? Just, just, just try it even now. And just, there is a limit. You can say it out loud, I can't hear you, but God can. There is a limit to how much I can attain. You know, God is the one that brings everything. Every good and perfect gift comes from him, right? There is a limit to how much I can attain. Just drink that in. Also try saying there is a limit to how much I can sustain. Who here would like to just take this moment to unmute for four seconds and just say one or one? You can choose one of those two sentences and just say it out loud. We're, we're in a family setting, so no one, everyone's going to cheer you on. But if you just want to say one of those as like your prayer, I, just, I would encourage you just to do that. There is a limit to how much I can attain. Thank you, Leah. There's a limit to how much I can sustain. That's great. There's a limit to how much I can sustain. That's good. Mm. yes lord we we agree we say it we say it, jesus if you if you had you didn't heal everyone you didn't heal everyone on planet earth you were only in active ministry for three years man jesus if you knew contentment and peace and were able to say there's a limit i can only do what i see my father doing i can only i can only do that lord i just get that into our beings so that contentment rather than comparison starts to just be our, our experience and let peace, not pressure. Oh Lord, release it in the name of Jesus. And amen. amen. And I amen. just, amen. Thank you, Jackie. Bless you. And Ooh, I just, you're making me really cry. Good. Well, not good, but you know, I hope it's a good thing. <laughs> Jesus. Nice is good tears. Nice good tears. Oh, thank you, sister. Well, I want to also just have a second point before we finish, which is limit, which is limits need to be learned, which is, you know, you see, if, if, if breaking limits is a way of describing what sin was, okay, actually we need to learn that. And that, that works at two levels, the, the individual level, and then secondarily, the we community level, just quickly, this is quite specific and practical, but it, it will help us go, oh, how do I actually grow in this, Tom? How do I grow in having limits? <laughs> well, number one uh, to the eye level, there's two key elements. You need to know yourself and you need to know your season. You need to know yourself and you need to know your season. John Calvin famously said, all true wisdom is either knowledge of God or knowledge of self. That was John Calvin, okay? You couldn't describe him as a navel gazer. He was quite a clever man. And he, even he realized you need to know yourself. It's not, I mean, it can become indulgent to, to always be thinking about yourself but your father really loves you. Do you know that? Jesus is really into humans, despite our evil and our sin. If he was like physically in that room, he wouldn't be hurrying you along. He'd be just wanting to be with you and for you to feel very cared for and loved and for you to know yourself as he knows you. 
It's a kind invitation of Jesus. So what does that mean? Well, just, you know, just some seeds for, for me to sow now, and you can work on this over the next few days. Know your, your limits socially, okay? We're social beings. We're all different, Josie and I. <laughs> There's a whole sermon on that one. We're really different. Josie has different limits with her social appetite and her, her capacity than me. What are your limits socially? Do you, do you, have you ever even thought about that? Jesus knows them. Number two, what are your limits physically? We're all getting a little older, even I. I remember experiencing tremendous jet lag the last few times I flew. And I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, I really have limits. I cannot just jump on planes. There's, the church in England that we were part of has started nine other churches. And I, I had delusions of grandeur that I could help sustain them through my leadership by flying around. And I was, That's ridiculous. They're God's church. I, I mean, I can help them through Skype and stuff. And occasionally I can't jump on a plane every few months. I want to die. So I had to just be honest about that. I have physical limits, right? What are your physical limits? I'm rubbish at Frisbee. Embrace that limit. There it is, whatever else it might be. What are your intellectual limits? I mean, man, this is humbling. Living in San Francisco, everyone's so clever. Oh, I had delusions of grandeur before I came here. I talk about the school I went to. It's, I don't talk about that much now. Just be honest, everyone's so clever. I look at this room or this Zoom room, and I, honestly, it's not an exaggeration that there's a lot of firepower uh, intellectually. What are your intellectual limits? Honestly, embracing it and, and working in team and releasing others is such a joy. What are your emotional limits? Do you know that? What are your actual emotional limits? I mean, I'm going through a tremendous season of excavation at the moment about my past, which is wonderful. But it does mean that I um, have to go a little slower, even more slower than normal. I can't make as many decisions or else I'll do them unconsciously um, from that kind of comparison part of me. Oh, yes, we'll do that because I think of the lie, there's endless things we can attain. Or I'll do it out of the lie, oh, there's endless things we can sustain. And so for the sake of everyone around me, I'm, tr I, I'm, a, I'm aware of my emotional limits mean I have to slow everything down a bit. And I'm finding myself saying, um, can I think about that for a little bit <laughs> more than I normally do? Because I, I need that, that pace. What, do you know yourself spiritually? You know, Paul talking to the Corinthians, he's like, I, I love you to bits, but I can't address you as spiritual men and women. You're babies. Do you, do you know where you're at spiritually? It's okay. It wasn't condemnation, but it's like you have limits. There are people who are further ahead spiritually than you, and that's okay. It's, it's just kind of being aware of that. So first of all, being aware of, your, of yourself those limits secondarily being aware of your season ecclesiastes says there's a season for everything some you know seasons include so much whether we're younger or whether we're older that's a season that affects our limits it just does you know um whether you're single or married each of those has certain limits on them whether you've got kids or no kids whether you've got younger kids or older kids this is huge for us because particularly as this community gets formed us knowing each other's seasons it means there's compassion as we you know as we as we all have different things that are limits for us and we have our limits and we assume someone else's limits are the same and then we forget because so this is hugely important are you in a fruitful season or a pruning season you might want to write that one down that's a biggie both are biblical the world we live in is all about fruitfulness, right? Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm really, really down at the moment. Oh, please don't say that. Can you give me the right answer, which is you're fine and everything's good. Okay, yeah, I'm good. But actually, biblically, there's, there's death and there's resurrection, right? They're both. Which kind of season are you in? I, um, I, just, I was going to do a, 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 like a video for a, a church recently and I said yes quickly and then I felt no peace about it and I knew I'd done it because of that lie that there's no limits to how much I can attain and my ego was involved and I had this thing of like oh yeah they'll watch it and then think highly of me so I just emailed them and said I'm terribly sorry I rushed that decision I'm actually going through a lot of painful 
like good but painful stuff at the moment with counselor and i just i just it will be beyond my limits to try and do that i'm is that okay and they were like of course you can do it whenever or never but it but as i did that i uh, i kind of felt a wave of contentment come like before it i'd been like comparing myself i've got to get this perfectly right to make sure people think high. and i thought no just let. and there's this wave of like let it go there is a limit to how much you can attain tom you cannot scrabble after every single opportunity to get your big face on social media or in the world just be content with jesus's face okay and it was just this contentment in my head going back into a little bit of obscurity that's good for me you I remember when uh, about a year and a half ago, we were uh, our last few months at, at Radiant Church in Visalia. And I, f I knew I had five invitations to travel, one to Hawaii, one to Cape Town, um, one to the UK, uh, and one to New Zealand, and then one to another part of America, all within four months. I mean, come on, all with ministry. And I was like, come on, the Lord is good. And, um, but you know what? I then felt no permission to do any of them because we were going to be leaving this precious community in Visalia. And I wanted, I knew it was going to be a kind of death season, you know, like a kind of a, a grieving season. And I, it was unusual for me. I, I managed to find the inner emotional intelligence to say, thank you, but I can't say yes. And I felt quite guilty because a lot of those were people really wanting support and investment. And I had to like, let you know, that lie of there's limits to how much I can sustain. I had to just close that down and say, Lord, I entrust all those people to you. I need to focus on Josie, the kids and Radiant and Visalia and do this well. And there's a limit to how much I can do. So what are the, do you know yourselves well, your seasons and then also yourselves? And then the final bit of the jigsaw, and then with this we'll finish, is the we, the we element, that sort of the, the corporate or the, the, uh, the family dimension that we need limits to need to be learned as we build this community. And I guess the most simple, succinct way of saying this is this, and this will, a lot of you will get this word when I say it, because it's been used a lot in, in the last 10, 20 years, is understanding boundaries. Boundaries. What does that mean? It means that we are together, and yet we are separate. We are together, but we are separate. And you say, well, Tom, is that a biblical, where does it say boundaries in the Bible? Well, Galatians chapter 6 Paul says, you're to bear each other's burdens, we're together, but don't try and carry someone else's load. There's a difference. You're together, but you need to have a, your own sense of self. Your own sense of self, that you are not synonymous with each other. It's a really profound way of understanding things. Jesus, when his mum's like, hey, they've run out of wine, sort it out, Jesus. And Jesus is like, no, mum. And he has that sense of boundary. He has that sense of like, that is an issue over there. He obviously prays to the father and then feels an invitation to do it. But the, even Jesus demonstrated that sense of incredible emotional intelligence that we are together and I love you, but we are separate. Now, this is very important because if we don't have this sense of togetherness yet separateness, the opposite of that is where there's like no limits between us is that there's a lack of clarity between where we end and they begin. And what happens in that kind of situation is very damaging is number one, we can be damaged and controlled by others, people's expectations of us. If there's no sense of boundary, there's no sense of, well, we're together, but I actually have dignity and equal worth and a sense of self as as you do if, if there's no like metaphoric wall between you healthy limit what happens is you just become someone who is controlled by your what everyone else's expectations are of you i don't know if any of you would say yeah i can definitely fall into that tom shaw does i know that is something that i can so see the other side of it is that other people can get damaged other people can get damaged if we become those who almost violate their sense of self. And I want to say this, so many Christians I've met in the last few years 
have been horribly damaged in church world because of this issue. Because there's not an emotional intelligence that we are separate people. We're together, but we're separate. So, so there's an expectation that you will basically burn yourself out in this church and you feel like no ability to go, well, how can I actually communicate my world? And it's, it's horrible. It is, and it's worst. It's a kind of spiritual abuse. Most leaders don't intend to do that, but it can lead that way. And instead there's this beautiful biblical pattern of community where we're together, but we're separate. I have a sense of self that Jesus loves me and I am actually have got dignity and worth and value as a human being as much as you. And that beautiful dynamic is so powerful. It's so powerful. So you need to be aware of things that can make you um, fall into this trap, either of someone who allows others to um, control you with their expectations, or you're someone who does it the other way around. Or if you're like me, I can end up doing it, either being the one who's controlled or trying to do it to others at different times. And I think it varies depending on things like your personality style. I think your birth order. I think who you're with can massively affect this. I think how gifted you are. I think your leadership position, all these things can play into um, boundaries not being right. Amen. Boundaries not being right. It's such a powerfully, this is huge. I want to finish by saying, when I was almost burning out six or seven years ago and I had my sabbatical in England, the fruit of that time was the first step was me realizing I had such a poor sense of boundaries. You know, I, there was no like separation in my spirit and my heart between me and everyone else, which meant I constantly lived with a sense of guilt that I should be doing more, which meant when I wrote down the main things that I did as a leader, it was 35 different main things. And each one of those was like a main, like preaching, you know, pastoring, there's 35. And it was because I just listened to that voice of guilt. I I, I assumed everyone wanted me to be doing all these things. And eventually I was ill, (laughs) burning out, exhausted. No sense of like, I'm actually important to Jesus. Like he loves me. I have a sense of dignity and worth, even if I did nothing because of his kindness. And so I came out with this plan, um, which basically said, I, I, if I'm going to survive another seven years, everyone, O City Church, I'm going to do five basic things. I'm going to like preach. I'm going to pastor people. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be in the Bible. And then my fifth thing was like AOB you know, like other things that need to be done, but I'm shifting from 35 to five. And um, honestly, at first people, some people were confused. Some people thought I was lazy, but this was the thing. Even if they thought I was lazy, there was a gift of that limit. My physical body couldn't do another seven years living in that place. I had to change. And so for the first time I had this like internal authority to be able to say, I totally understand why you think I'm lazy because you've been in a church that I, I have actually led and basically um, set the wrong culture, which is you push through your limits. Just keep pushing through your limits because there's so much need. I have set that. And so the second step after me saying, I need to go at a pace I can sustain and still have integrity with Jesus, integrity with my family. The second step is then I said to the church, now I want to empower each and every one of you to unhurriedly process with no guilt or no shame. What are the few things with faith and joy that you can actually do and be that, that will bring life to this community? In fact, I actually repented to the church. Some of you are from Mike and Sarah from city. They'll probably remember this. I said, so we were doing multi-site church and, and I, I was listening to that lie of like, there's no limits to how much we can attain. Yeah. Cause I wanted everything to be perfect. And so we would have multiple bands doing video locations. Everything was set up three locations set up from scratch every week. And I said to the church, I am so sorry. I, I want to repent of using you. I, I, it is so wrong. And 
I, I know I want to live within my limits and be joyful and go at a slower pace and just make things simpler for me. And I want to empower you, O oh church, to, to say no. If you need to say no to stuff with good conscience, you say no with no guilt or shame. And so we had to have a simpler setup. We had less. I remember there was one drummer called Johnny Ward who was just used. I mean, he's phenomenal. And we were like, that, we were like My, Johnny, you haven't had a break in like 60 years. Just 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 be a christian and love your wife and put your sticks down i'm so sorry that we forced you to do and 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 honestly the product wasn't as good you know if you came in you're like hey this church product's not quite shiny enough and i was like brother sister but if we have a happy family rather than a shiny product that is 10 times more glorifying to god and if you don't get it that's okay there's lots of places you can pick but that's our value and friends if you're part of sanctuary the reason it's called sanctuary is because we want you, if you have felt used or just like a utility and you've, and, and, and you just, I don't want, I don't want to do that. I want to go at a pace where there's joy and there's life. And it means we won't better do as many things as a church. <laughs> you know, like I don't drive my family. We do a few things and we have to say no a lot. And as a church family, we're just going to have to settle into that truth of that. Do you know what? We have limits. We have small babies. We have sickness, we have unemployment, and God loves us. We are weak. You know, when I think, I was, I was with Victor recently, uh, we're in camping, and we, we had like Victor's family and my family, and, and the walks were there, and we were like walking along, and, along this path, and there was like really small kids at the, at the bottom at end of the walk, and then there was like, you know, people zooming ahead at the top, and me and Victor were like trying, was, like, trying to keep control, not control, make sure no one was, you know. In fact, we saw a rattlesnake on that walk. And we were just trying to kind of keep everyone, uh, you know, um, alive, basically. And I said, it was sort of chaos. And I said to Victor, I said, this is church leadership. This is church. It's like leading the people of God out of Egypt would have been like glorious chaos. You'd have the slow, the medium and the fast and actually different limits, different paces. It's such a beautiful thing. And actually that is success. That is that picture, as messy as it sounds, I think is success of a healthy family, even if the product of the events isn't quite as shiny, the health, the health of it, man, is, is such a big deal. I hope that's been helpful. I've tried to be really practical today. Um, we're going to sing. Thank you. I'm getting lots of thumbs up. Uh, you, a lot of you are going to be in your sanctuary groups, midweek groups this Thursday. Think of those questions. This is the sort of topic that you think about and then there's like 50 questions afterwards and I've had to try and be vaguely concise uh, for me anyway. So there's lots of things I could have said, but hopefully there's enough there to get you liberated. Enjoy those limits, friends. It brings contentment and peace. Now, uh, Sylvester,